Hi, I'm Sandy. How are you today? And this is Ancestry Rose webcast where we talk about Appalachia and Appalachian stories and themselves. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Susan Stone, president of Frontier Nursing University. Before we talk to Dr. Stone and get to know her and Frontier a little bit better, I want to share with you a film called The Forgotten Frontier. And on The Forgotten Frontier, is about the Frontier Nursing Service that started in 1925. So to talk about the Frontier Nursing University, we have to go backwards. So this film is a silent film. It's, I'm only gonna show you about two minutes of it. It has a lot of very interesting footage. And this is live at the time in 1931 in Appalachia, Kentucky. So enjoy the show. Okay, that kind of gives you a little bit of information. Let me introduce our guest, though, Dr. Susan Stone. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about the history of Frontier Nursing Service and also currently your president of Frontier Nursing University. Correct. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun to talk about uh, Frontier and its history and what's happening today. You are a wealth of knowledge. So we're, we're going to find out everything we can find out about the inception all the way to where we are right now. Uh, just a little bit of information about Dr. Stone. Excuse me. She's a certified nurse midwife and a leader in strategic development to increase the quality and capacity of midwifery and advanced practice in the nurse workforce. The one thing that I find very interesting, and a lot of people did ask me this question, so we're going to kind of answer this right off the bat, but we'll go into detail the second half of this program. Behind Dr. Stone's leadership, Frontier's focus is on educating primary care providers to serve rural and underserved populations. So you are still continuing with the care that was started in 1925 with the Frontier Nursing Services. And that was, I think, the primary goal back then as it is now. That's right. Uh, when uh, Mary Breckenridge did start the Frontier Nursing Service, it was started as a demonstration project. She wanted to be able to show that if you brought in a group of midwives um, and coordinated and organized the care, that you could improve the health of the community. Um, so she wanted to be able to document those, the data and really show us how we could do it and then have that replicated in other areas of the country. So it was always the hope that it would be replicated. It, the way that we're doing that today is through our students. Did she have success early on with replicating or she was still working on the goals of building it? So, you know, she, um, I'll take you back just a little bit, you know, about how and why she started the service. 
Now, Mary Breckenridge was originally a public health nurse. That was her specialty, public health. And um, she, in post-World War I, she went to France to help with actually the post-war devastation that was going on over there. There were tons of public health issues, no housing, chilled, a lot of orphans. Most of the men in um, France were killed, um, literally. And um, so it was just a terrible mess over there. She, um, she went to volunteer as a public health nurse and helped them to start a public health service. While she was there, um, there were midwives there from France and there were nurse midwives who came from England. And she said, as she watched them practice and um, provide care, she thought that the nurse midwife could be uh, just the solution for the rural areas of the United States because they were both public health nurses and midwives. And if you remember back in 1925, the, the birth rate was very, very high. Um, there was lack of access to any birth control. And so um, it was not unusual for families to have eight to 10 um, children. So it was necessary to have both the public health aspect and the midwifery aspect if you wanted to care for those families. Did we have a public health network in let's use where she was at Appalachia, Kentucky at the time before she came in, we didn't have a strong public health network back in the, the hollers in the branches and such, right? Well, no, we did not. Um, we did have a public health structure and public health nurses in Kentucky, but she wanted to choose a place that would be so difficult that nobody could say, well, maybe you can do it there, but we can't do it where we live. So she really wanted to choose this place that had little access to care and um, particularly Hyden, Kentucky, which is where the center of the service was, um, really had no roads. I mean, there was, there was only uh, a couple of ways to get around. One was on foot and one was on horseback. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very, uh, so she really wanted to show that she, did come to Hyden, Kentucky at the, in 1923, which was two years before she started the service. And she did a survey of the entire county. So she actually rode on horseback over 600 miles over the course of a summer to trying to recreate what was the data. She interviewed families. She looked at their Bibles where they kept their mm -hmm. documentation of their families. And she looked for health providers and I think she found one physician who came out of hazard, but was not there all the time. There were some uh, lay midwives or granny midwives uh, providing care, um, but you know, largely there was no health care being provided in, in Leslie County. And, and so that is why she chose that place for uh, to to do this demonstration project, where she could literally show what a um, a nursing service could do for the people of, of that territory. So you just said two things that were fascinating to me. So she started this mostly to, to get that. It, it wasn't full in, let's bring a whole complement of nurses in immediately. Let's, let's look at what we're dealing with first, which is even today we should be doing that. And sometimes it's unheard of. We just tend to throw a lot of people or money at the problem. And she didn't. She actually went on into the, the data first, which is amazing to me. That's something new that I hadn't heard. And I would think that even if there was a physician or a doctor in, in Hazard, and like you mentioned, the granny midwives, it's sometimes really, especially in bad weather, it's tough to get to some of these locations and the you know, telephones are not here. So you can't right. call up somebody and say 911 or, hey, can granny midwife come over? Someone's probably going to get somebody and then bring them back. And that's time that is spent. So if you really picture yourself in Appalachia and in that particular part of Kentucky, it, Horses was the only way that was going to work, that or, or foot, and you're not going to make it probably on foot traffic. So that's um that's really interesting to me about the data. So if she gets the data, what does she do with that? Well, she finds that there is you know a very high maternal mortality rate, neonatal mortality rate, um, 
you know, there's just no, there's a high rate of worms. Um, there, it's, there are gunshot wounds, there are snake bites, there are all kinds of things going on where people literally do need help, but they're, they really don't have any place to go to get that help. So she identifies that this community does need help with health care. That was the first step. And, um, and that is something that we teach today to all our, all our students. You have to do a community assessment first. Mm -hmm. You can't go in and say, I know what you need. You have to go in and ask them, what do they need? It was also another way for the people of Leslie County to start to get to know her and what yeah. her goals were in the first place. So um, she chose, the, um, as, as I said, she chose Leslie County. She did recruit first, there were just two nurse midwives who she recruited to come from England. And, um, you know, the way, the only way to get there was, was to um, take a boat over, uh, move, mostly landing in the New York City area. Then they would take trains and they could take a train as far as Hazard, Kentucky, which is about, about 15, 16 miles from Hyden. And then they, from there it was horseback. And, um, you know, over the years, there were first two, but over the years there were many, and many were met there with a, a group of horses who had never even ridden a horse before. I was going to say, that was a wake-up call right there. You're, you're right. in Appalachia. <laughs> and if any of you have ridden horseback, you know your first ride should not be 15, 16 miles long, <laughs> up over hills and mountains and all of that kind of thing. But they were uh, brave nurse midwives who came. And so uh, she started her first clinic in Hyden in 1925. She always knew that what she wanted to do was take the care to the people because it was just too hard for everybody to come to Hyden to get mm -hmm. care. So she set out to build clinics in various locations where she had identified would be kind of central. And within six years, she had built six clinics. And these were uh, clinics where she would have two nurse midwives live out at the clinics. And they would also run clinic, uh, usually... Actually, they did it maybe a half a day a week because most of their time was on horseback going out and doing home care. Um, that was the way to provide the most care to people was to go to their homes and um, and offer them services. So, and, and you might think right away, like, okay, what are they doing? Just riding up to cabins? Well, what they did uh, second we did have a public health officer uh, in Kentucky, and he told her that the first thing she needed to do was to really go out and now sur officially survey the people mm -hmm. and try to figure out what their needs were. So those two midwives and Mary Breckridge herself again went out and surveyed and visited like every cabin, told them that what they were there for, and um, and what the purpose was. And of course, what do you think happened while they were there? They treated. Exactly. <laughs> so they found all kinds of things going on in the mothers and the fathers. They would say, you know, my baby has worms. My, you know, my, uh, my little boy has an infection. Um, you know, somebody got a, a bite on their foot or whatever. And they started treating all of those things and quickly became quite an um, important um, healthcare service. As I said, within six years, they built these six clinics across the region. And also in 1928, they built a very small hospital um, because she said, you know, even if we do public health care and outpatient care and, um, you know, catch the babies and make sure the babies are well, if the husband or anybody else has a ruptured appendix, we yeah. have to be able to take care of that too. So that's why they needed to have the hospital for those people that really needed, uh, that were sick enough to need hospital care. I think you so, bring up a good point too here that would, when we think about, especially the group of genealogists that, that I'm working with that are looking at Mary Breckenridge and her, her nurses and the Frontier Nursing Service, we're so focused on midwives, but the hospital brings in 
the other. And I imagine the nurse is just going, even if they go to help deliver a baby, there's always a child. Like you said, there is a large quantity of children in these families. Someone always is going to need some type of medical care from small to high. And I, it's a lot of people wonder how these nurses were able to gain the trust of these Appalachians in Kentucky that were remote. And you, you just said it, they, they introduced themselves and they went in to see what they needed instead of saying, I need to tell you what you need. And they traded them. They, they helped them anyway. Right. But the, and, and then the hospital just adds that other layer as well of trust that you know that if it's something that doesn't involve a baby, and you do have a medical need, that's where you can go. Now, did Mary have a physician at the hospital too? Was that a requirement or was it run by the midwives? So in fact, there was a physician, there was always a physician at Frontier Nursing Service. Well, I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. There was always a contracted physician, but mm -hmm. whether that physician was always there is another story. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but most times they did have a physician. They had, um, they consulted with the physician for difficult cases. And as I said, the physician majorly worked in the hospital. Sometimes they would call them out to the home for maybe a difficult birth. Um, but even then it was, that was so hard because for, by the time the physician got yeah. there, you know, they usually handled the situation. Um, there were a lot of things that they did um, as, now, I want to correct that. It wasn't really midwives, it was nurses. So they were nurse midwives. Thank and you. so when, if, if you hear the language or you read the history, you will say, you will hear them say, my nurse was coming out today. Mm -hmm. My nurse was coming to see me today. So the midwife was just a necessary add-on because there were so many babies being born. And so the two skills together was just what they needed. So, and so, so it was really a nursing service. Um, did so, they, did they, so when, when she was in France, she saw the midwife and then when she came back to Kentucky to do the data and look, that's when she realized this is more than just a midwife. This is a nurse. And would that be accurate? No. In, when she was in, um, there's a famous quote from Mary mm -hmm. Breckenridge. When she was in France, she said, um, I saw the French midwives working. They really only dealt with maternity care. So they took care of people while they were having their babies and shortly after. But the nurse midwives from England provided primary care. They took care of the entire family. And I felt that a, a provider trained in both nursing and midwifery would be the ideal practitioner for, um, for rural areas of the United States. And I would say she was pretty successful with that. If she's going to the point of having the clinics, having the hospital, that that was the model. Now, was she ever able to bring that model outside of, let's say, Kentucky? Unfortunately, she wasn't in her time. Um, she had hopes of um, doing another service over in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, but the... Um, uh, they had a lot of financial struggles. Remember, it was like 1930 now. They had yeah. built the six clinics and now we're in the depression. And um, and she had done a lot for fundraising because she really did not want, she wanted a service that people didn't have to pay for, basically. And I, I, I say that with a... Uh, um, because it wasn't exactly true. She would charge them like $5 a year for family care and then $6 if there was a pregnancy. But it was almost like managed care. Back. It was like an early <laughs> managed care. You did that uh, and um, but uh, and you got care whenever you needed it. Um, she also did a lot of trade, you know, eggs, those kinds of things. So that were helpful to, because she, she had you know, by the time six years have passed, there were about 24 midwives. And at one point in time, they had about 40 horses as well. So there was, it was quite a large service. They had volunteers, um, all kinds of things. And they would be taking things out to the clinics because as you said, no phones. 
So they were taking messages, information, and supplies out to the clinics. Um, you know, it was a very busy service. So, but, um, you know, the donations kind of dried up. And so that was very difficult. For her um, to expand it outside of her area. And I guess yeah. we should also mention that she does come from a very prominent family. She is the granddaughter of a vice president who um, her father, I believe, was a, a congressman, but also U.S. minister to Russia. So she did travel. She did have a different life than I would say some of those that she was treating. She did travel and she did see the world a little bit, which maybe gave her the perspective of what is going on in a global sense back then to bring back best practices to rural Kentucky. I think that's true. Um, you know, her little brother was born in Russia. So Mary Brecken was about um, 13 or 14 at that time. And she attended the birth with the midwives. There was a group of midwives who came. That was her first introduction to midwifery. So even back then, she was getting ideas for what she wanted to do. And, and you're absolutely right. She came from a prominent family. Her, her parents wanted her to marry, settle down and have a family, which yeah. she, she, you know, she did. She married twice. Um, you know, one time she was a widow and then she married again and had two children who both died of childhood illness. Well, one was premature and one apparently died of acute appendicitis. Mm. Um, or abdominal infection it wasn't completely clear, but those those experiences, um, you know, they gave her the incentive that she told her mother, "I want to go be a nurse. I want to be useful. I don't want to, you know, um, I don't want to just be a, a wife and mother." Um, even though she valued that very highly, she wanted to go on and do more. So that kicked off this whole thing, and she went to France and saw how they were doing. Um, uh, she was very interested in rural health care. She had advisors who said, go to Scotland. That's, they really know how to do uh, you know, health care in Scotland. And when you look at the service and how it ran, it was very, she really replicated a lot of the things she learned in Scotland and brought them back to the United States. Because she was in remote Scotland, right? She yes, was, absolutely. She wasn't in a town or, or you know, like the Edinburgh that we would know. She was in very, very remote World. All the way, all, you know, yes, absolutely, she was. So, um, yeah, so, so yes, she did learn a lot. I mean, you know, she was about 40 years old when she came to Haydn, so she had some oh. practice behind her. Mm -hmm. um, she, you know, wasn't, she, she had had 20 years of, of practicing as a nurse um, at, or in various areas behind her. Um, and she did put, you know, she searched for funding originally for Frontier Nursing Service and couldn't find it. She put all of what she had of her family's funds into that service to try to develop it and, and make a difference. That was her goal. But as you said, you know, we're coming up the Depression. We're coming up to World War II as well. So funding probably did get very tight. So that that obviously explains why she probably could not expand. But it had to be pretty tight for her right where she was in Kentucky as well. And is, is that about the time that she started the courier service to kind of have volunteers come in and help do the accessories is what I call not the nursing, but take care of the, the letters, the mail, the horses, the stuff that needs to happen for this to continue. That was one of the things that she did, you know, because she came from a wealthy family, she she had wealthy friends. And some of them really, you know, she would write them long letters and they were very interested in what she was doing. And they would say, how can we help? And, you know, aside from donations, one of the things she said was send me your sons and daughters and I will teach them service. And so many of that, she started the courier service back in 1928, soon after the service started because they realized they were overwhelmed by yeah. just, you know, all of the things that needed to be done. And that service, the courier service has been going on since then. We still have couriers come every summer for eight weeks and do community service. Um, but they were a very important part of the service. As I mentioned before, a lot of these nurse midwives who came from um, Britain, uh, 
they didn't even know how to ride a horse, let alone take care of a horse. So the couriers did, uh, many of them did. And uh, so they would teach the nurses how to ride. They would help them care for their horses. They would do all kinds of things that, that needed to be done. Because I can so see that was a fantastic service. But moving up to the 1939, uh -huh. which is when the school started. All right. So when she first started the school. So uh, that was always in the plan to start a school, but they were very busy doing all of these other things. In 1939, um, she had 21 nurse midwives there and 11 of them elected to go home back to England. Was that because of the, the impending war? Yes, they wanted to be with their families. And so she said right away, it's time to start the school. But we put it off long enough. And, um, and so they implemented the school in November of 1939 with two nurses. There were just two nurses first. And, um, and so, uh, but it took off and became, it was actually the second midwifery school in the United States just a few years before one opened in New York City, which was assisted by Mary Breckridge and her and her midwife. So, um, you know, it was it, it immediately became successful, and nurses would come from all over the United States, and a lot of them were doing international um, work as well, and they would find themselves not having enough skill. Um, so they wanted to come and become midwives too, for the same reason as everybody else, that there were lots of babies and, yeah. you know, they had to be taken care of and pregnant mothers had to be cared for and uh, that kind of thing. So, um, was that so the her love or do you think that was where her true heart was with the school? Is, was that also one of her main goals? It was definitely one of her main goals. But her real love was for children. Mm. And she really wanted to make a better world for children. She was very much touched, of course, by her own children dying so young. Um, and then when she was in France, there were so many children that were in destitute places without parents. Yeah. And she felt that a, a little care could go a long way with these children and, and give them a much better life. So that is when, when you read her work, you know, you hear her talk about the children. And, um, you know, with the midwives, she said, I think there was a quote that says something like the greatest, um, the greatest time of danger for a baby is um, when they are still in utero and, mm -hmm. and during their birth. And so she wanted to pay close attention to that in order to, to have a healthy child. Um, and then keep the health of the children too. I this was probably before we had mandatory shots and immunizations and things like that. So the nurses were quite busy. Yes, they did. They went out and um, uh, did immunizations. They went to the schools, and it's interesting. There was tons of discussion about is it safe? Should we do this? And uh, you know. Uh, Kind of like today, a little bit. I was going to say, sounds familiar. <laughs> sounds familiar. Uh, but they did. And um, that's in the rest of that little clip video that you showed. There's another whole clip about doing the immunizations. Um, they also taught people things about how to have clean sanitation, like when they were building their outhouses, mm -hmm. um, you know, how to, you know, there were some people that actually built outhouses over the stream. Oh. Because it was so efficient, but they had to, you know, they taught them like, no, that's, you know, what's going to happen down here. Down and the line, it's not. Down good. the line. <laughs> and so they really kind of taught them some of those things, how to prevent worms. And, you know, there was one campaign where, um, you know, the little girls would put on dresses, especially on Sundays. And what would happen is th they had burns. So these little dresses would catch on fire from the coal stoves and oh. uh, they never saw that in the little boys. They only saw that in the little girls. And so they did a campaign to keep the little girls in jeans as well and coveralls. Oh, and, interesting. Yes, to, to protect them. And so, you know, just a lot, true public health, a lot of true public health. It really um, is. And it's, it's, 
you know, it, it's familiar in a way that we, we are going, I think, back to a pure public health model, at least in the United States, I feel like we are now. So it's interesting how sometimes we always say, at least my, my mom is real big about this, the old ways are still good. They so, are. They really are. And um, so then when we come up to the, we have nurses leaving because the war is going to start. Now, obviously, you're not going to have nurses traveling back and forth across the ocean during the war as well. So the school started and she's doing real well with that. And I guess after the war, she continues with the school and she continues because she lives until this into the 60s, 1960s, I believe. Right. And yes. she so she's showing that she's still really pretty successful. I have some stats. Let me I'm going to read them. Um, you know, she died in 1965 at age 84. I have some stats that are that were fascinating to me. So her frontier nursing service had treated approximately 58,000 patients. So by the time she died, it, and you might not think that that's a lot. For those that are watching, you might not think that 58,000 is not a lot. But remember, she's and her nurses, they're visiting on horseback. They're visiting in very, very remote areas. This isn't a doctor's office where the doors open and you come on in. They had to do a lot of traveling to get to these 58 patients. And they delivered 14,500 babies. And as we've already noted, that is a time frame where a lot of children were born into families. But what's even more fascinating with the stat, out of 14,500 babies, only 11 maternal deaths out of that. That is, that's just amazing that they were able to accomplish that. And I'm going to assume, as you've mentioned before, it's through education. It's through visiting and seeing how they live, help educate them to live a little differently, better, like we mentioned, the outhouses or clean, things like that, but also being there to deliver the child as well. Right, right. Being there, you know, in childbirth. Um, I mean, that's you know, amazing. Most, most births go fine, you know, and, and you, you really don't need, you need support, help, cleans, mm -hmm. cleanliness, those yeah. kinds of things. Um, but when something does go wrong, it can be such a small adjustment to make to make it go back on course again if you know what you're doing. Yeah. And so, you know, just being able to be with the women and um, help them. And of course, you know, in all of nursing, we know, think about it, people are just all of healthcare. People, you, you're not going to follow people around and take care of them. You have to teach them mm -hmm. how to take care of themselves. And so there was a lot of um, incentive. Mothers, mothers always want to learn how to do better with their children. I mean, it's it's pretty standard. It's a very nice time to kind of uh, teach people because they're they're incentivized to learn, right? Yeah. When they're becoming a parent. And so you know, a lot of those. And what Mary Breckenridge also taught us was that you have to form relationships with people. You do. It's all about relationships because if they trust you, then they'll tell you what's happening and uh, and you can assist them. But if they don't trust you, they're not going to share. And that is absolutely true today. Um, if we go into a pro healthcare provider and don't feel respected and, and, and feel like we're in a trustworthy place, um, yeah. it, and respect is a big part of that, then we just want to leave. We do. We do. <laughs> so, it, so. It's very interesting, too, because, oh, I, again, I get a lot of these questions. How did she go in there and get trusted? And we've discussed that. But you're so right. If she hadn't put that groundwork in and the other two original midwives, if they hadn't put that groundwork in, and we're talking a lot of miles on horseback again. We're talking yes. through, there's there's pictures of her going through rivers. There's uh, lakes, mountains, snow. We, uh, we read one story where one of the nurses was so frozen that she needed help off of her horse. She could not get off her horse because she's so frozen. 
So when we say that she put in the legwork to get that trust, she really did. And if she had no, this would have never worked because that group of people, they need that trust. And right. we do too today as individuals, but that, that group of individuals and in Appalachia especially, I know because I come from there, I live there currently, we do. We have a hard time trusting. And if, as you mentioned, she came in and said, this is what we're going to do. This is what you need and we're going to do it and you're going to accept it. No go. <laughs> no go. No go. And she told the nurses too, don't talk about politics. Um, and um, she didn't want any of her nurses dating people. Oh, I didn't talk people. about that. She, just, she said, we're there to provide service. Don't get involved in, you know, um, contentious, wow. anything contentious. Yeah. Just stay away from it. And, um, and so, you know, there were certain rules. She also, they always wore uniforms, mm -hmm. always were in uniform. And that was a way to identify the nurse. And that really helped too, because there was some violence there. I mean, it was a time of um, violence over alcohol and, and things was, like yeah. that were going on. Uh, but no, nobody ever hurt any of the nurses. They were always respected and they helped them out when they needed, you know, when they needed help. And I believe- so, Let me just really tell you a couple of things that are very interesting to bring you up closer to our time. So- Oh, that's uh, right. The school starts in 1939. So what happens usually is about 10 students come each year and live there and they practice with the nurse midwives and they have classes and they graduate. And that is how the school ran from 1939 all the way up until 1989. It was just that, you oh. know, students coming, staying for that time. Many of them would then stay a couple extra years and that they could pay off their tuition that way, you know, so that you could, you know, so that a lot of them would go, would do the educational program. And then, um, you know, as I said, uh, but a couple of major things happened. One in the, right around 1960, the birth control pill came out and they were, they, they first had to do demonstrations with the birth control pill. They had to, they were testing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, they had a project in an urban setting, which I believe was Washington, D.C., and then a, a rural setting, which they asked Frontier Nursing Service to participate in. Oh, that's a huge bit of history. Okay. Yeah. And so that was quite a thing. And, you know, when you read, there's articles written about that time. Mary Breckenridge wasn't sure she wanted to do it or whether this would be good. But she took it to the advisory committee. She had an advisory committee in town and they said yes to it. So uh, women were recruited and asked if they wanted to try the pill. Well, the birth rate dropped dramatically in the next 10 years. And so suddenly you're having more like three to five babies instead mm -hmm. of eight to 10. And, and also at that time, there was a, um, a we started to learn how to treat things like diabetes, medications for hypertension, more, you know, more, more uh, treatment for primary mm -hmm. care issues. And so that was when Frontier Nursing Service started the Family Nurse Practitioner Program. So that was the first Family Nurse Practitioner Program in the country. Um, started in 1970 um, at Frontier Nursing Service. So that th those two things were pretty big. They are uh, very big. You know, some people would come and do the family nurse practitioner program. Some would do the nurse midwife program and some would do both. And they would be called uh, family nurse midwives. Um, but at the same time, still the rural clinics ran. Well, they're still running down there um, in, in Hyden, in and around Hyden. And so uh, the need for primary care was always there. A lot of things changed over that time, uh, about that time. We got anesthesia for childbirth, and a lot of women wanted anesthesia for childbirth. And so uh, more and more people started coming into the hospital to get, to give birth. Um, and, uh, and that caused a lot of change. So fewer home births, most of the early births were, were home births. Mm -hmm. um, but fewer home births, just like the rest of the country. Although typically Haydn was you know 10 to 15 years behind the rest of the country in that because they had a comfortable 
home birth service. So they were used they, to it. Right. They were used to it. They were used to it. Um, so anyways, that, uh, that occurred. So, uh, and then how do we transition over to what we are today to the, the frontier nursing university? Yes. Yeah. That was a big change. So what happened was, um, by 19, around late eighties and 1990, the population of, um, Leslie County was getting smaller. And a lot of the people in Leslie County were older, not childbearing. Mm -hmm. And if they were childbearing, they were having many fewer babies. And it was harder and harder to get enough births to train a large group of nurse midwifery students every year down in Hyden. Well, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So they started having to send students to different places to get more births. And I mean, you have to attend births. It's a way that you train to become a midwife. Yeah. And so at the same time, there was another program going on up in um, Pennsylvania that was started by a Frontier graduate. And her name was Kitty Ernst. She graduated from Frontier in 1951. But she determined that um, she is a big problem solver. And she determined that there were many nurses living in rural areas. And if if we would give them an opportunity to get a graduate education as a midwife without making them leave home, probably they would do that. And that there were, there was a great need for midwives. We, we were not graduating enough midwives to serve America. And so her and some of her colleagues from Case Western Reserve University helped out, um, Maternity Center Association helped out, the American Association of, of Childbearing Centers helped out and um, and they they devised this distance education program where people could where well, nurses you have to be a nurse but a nurse could become a midwife um, by doing some visits to where the campus was supposed to be and um, and then doing a lot of their work at home and then training in uh, community settings in their own towns in their own areas That's in their own areas and this would also be a way that of providing because we're the the goal was to recruit from rural and underserved areas so mm -hmm. hopefully then those people would stay in those areas as nurse midwives and serve in those areas so uh to make a long story short um frontier is really struggling with this traditional program this innovative new program was very popular mm -hmm. a lot of students enrolled in it and including me i was in that first <laughs> class um, uh, wanted to be a midwife, but lived so far up in upstate New York, there was really no way that I could, you know, so that was the typical story of most of the students who came to those distance, early distance learning classes. And so Frontier then adopted in 1989, the distance learning model. And, um, so that was the story from there. I mean, it was in, if you look at the history, just, you know, numbers wise, in those first 50 years from 1939 to 1989, they graduated about 500 nurse midwives. And in the um, years since 1990 to now, we've graduated about 8,000. Oh. So you can see how, you know, it, we were able to grow the program by using this distance learning model. And it was very effective. Uh, the employers were, um, you know, said these these graduates come and hit the ground running. They know what they're doing, um, and so by the, in the first seven years, they graduated the first one thousand nurse midwives, and they were from every single state in the United States. That's so amazing. really, yeah, really hitting those rural areas, um, you know. We had people in North Dakota and South Dakota and Alaska and Hawaii and, you know, all of those, Iowa, Idaho, you name it. Uh, there well, was this is great, too, because I want to point out, again, this is how you're continuing the tradition. You are going and also recruiting in those rural areas, giving them the ability to be a distance learning. That's right. That's right. So, so this, this is really a great solution all the way around. Yeah, it really is. Um, 
you know, it was so successful that we, you know, decided, you know, to do the family nurse practitioner program as a distance program. And then um, we started our doctoral program so that we could offer that at, at a distance. And our newest program in 2017, just because of all of the need, um, you know, with the drug problems mm -hmm. and depression, we started a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner program in 2017. And there are 500 students in that program. So right now, so it is. Um, I was thrilled to see that. I think that especially as we talk about Appalachia, we do know that there has been a drug problem, but we also know that even just the, the employment can be stagnant in that area, which can cause some depression and some, sure. I, I don't think that as, as a whole in a country that we really talk enough about the mental health. So when I saw that that was offered, I thought that was brilliant because a lot of people will trust those providers that they're already using as well, or that they're familiar as, as opposed to bringing somebody in from out of their area well, you're, you're still using the model. We're here. We're going to train who we have here and who you're comfortable and you trust. It goes back to that trust again. And I imagine your nurses, your graduates probably had a heck of a time with COVID as well. So nursing is, is so valuable. You never know what's around the corner that you're going to need. And COVID must have thrown your nurse graduates um, for, for a loop and a lot of work. Well, it did. You know, the thing about our program is, you know, our nurses, our average age is 35. The, the, our students are nurses who have worked quite some time as nurses and then decided that this was the time to expand their um, their scope of practice and, and add this in. And so most of our nurses work and are raising families. And they're really busy. And they're during COVID, there was a lot of, you know, tug and pull because, you know, their their employers wanted them to work more hours. Their children needed them because they were at home, they weren't mm -hmm. in school, and they wanted to pursue their education. So, you know, we had to do a lot of things like slow them down and just say, just take one class at a time and, you know, just really help them to work through COVID. Um, things are much more back to normal now, but COVID was such a struggle for everybody. And the nursing profession, I mean, we had a lot of nurses that just left the profession That's because it was just too hard. Um, and there, you know, we have more articles about, you know, coping in nursing mm -hmm. and uh, the depression in nursing also. So we have to take care of ourselves. Um, as well as take care of our patients. And it's a challenge, but we can support each other and do that. Is there a nursing shortage in the U.S. now? Yeah. Oh, yes, there is definitely a nursing shortage in the U.S. And some of it stems from not enough, um, there are not enough nurse educators. Mm -hmm. So even when they start a program, for example, uh, nurses have to have clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just put, say, four nursing schools around Lexington at Kentucky because there's not enough hospitals for them to do their clinical work. Right. Um, but we're working on that and <laughs> a lot of strategies going into that. So, um, I, you know, I'm hopeful that we can solve that. The other thing is recruiting people because now people, you know, you know, there's a certain vision that nursing might be too hard, just too oh. hard after, you know, all of the stories of the pandemic. So you've got to just kind of change the narrative a little bit on yes. that. Yes. Well, um, are you ready for some questions? I saw one or two come up and one of them was kind of interesting. Um, let me say, could men also be a midwife? So Absolutely. I guess the question is really, do you have a lot of males going through the system to be a midwife or a nurse midwife. So we we don't have a lot of males, but we want more males. There's no reason a man cannot be a midwife. Um, you know, I have known some wonderful male midwives in our professional organization, the American College of Nurse Midwives. We have a group of men in midwifery, and we usually have one or two 
um, men in our program at any time. So it can be a little lonely because we have 900 midwifery students and only a couple of them are men. But if a man is interested, there's absolutely no reason not. I mean, some people think, let's face it, um, uh, you know, most uh, obstetricians were men until mm -hmm. about the last 10 or 15 years. So, um, That's true. you know, there's no reason that if you are a caring person um, and you want to be a midwife, that you can't be then a midwife just because you're a man. And then we have another question from Diane. Why do you think this idea started in Britain and not the U.S.? I guess back around 1925 when Mary started it. Britain has a long, long history of midwives. And here in, you know, in the United States, right around 1925, we had a lot of midwives here that were immigrants that came and, and cared for their communities. And, um, and some had some education and some had less education and some were good and some were not so good. And so the uh, medical environment, um, I mean, you can Google this, the midwife problem. <laughs> but they called it the midwife problem and they, they really worked hard to take privileges away from midwives and to move um, maternity care into a medical model. So it was an absolute, I mean, you can read about it. It was organized. It were, you know, uh, there were articles about it all over. We have to get rid of these midwives. And um, we they were know. competition, I guess. Or they like competition. Yeah, they were competition. And there were some bad outcomes, but there were also bad doctors too. Yeah. But, you know, so there were both. But, um, you know, we know today, and even the federal government is providing a lot of funding for midwifery training right now, because the best care comes when you're a team. And so mm -hmm. a midwife provides things that a physician doesn't generally. So, for example, most physicians, and I don't say, I never say all, because there are some, mm -hmm. but they don't want to have a 30-minute conversation about the benefits of breastfeeding, or mm -hmm. is your husband hitting you? Or, you know, why why are your feet swollen? Yeah. What have you been eating? You know, sit down and have that long conversation with you. And those are the social determinants of health that we have to address if we're mm -hmm. going to improve uh, maternity care. Right now, we have the highest maternal mortality rate in the entire world of um, industrialized countries. Wow. And the US. The U.S. Uh, does, absolutely does. Um, you can Google that, the maternal mortality yeah. problem. I mean, it's huge. And in other countries where midwives and physicians work together, they're much lower. The mm -hmm. rates are much, much lower. And so it is a different kind of care. And when we have both together is when we have the best have care. success. Mm -hmm. We've got one question. Where were the or were the medications difficult to come by in the early days? The medications were difficult to come by, and there were also regulations even back then. So some of the midwives with the nurse midwives that worked back in, um, in at Frontier Nursing Service said that um, they were not allowed to give antibiotics, for example. Oh. Um, they were allowed to give pain medication, but they were not allowed to give antibiotics. So there was controls over what they could give and they found that extremely frustrating um, because they knew what they had to do. And, uh, yeah. and yet, you know, today we're still uh, fighting about prescriptive privileges today, today in Congress right now. So that, that story goes on and on and, you know, there's, you know, who's got the control. And we have, we are very well trained in pharmacology and the ability to give these drugs for certain um, conditions. So they they were struggling with the same thing then. So it's interesting because they, they almost had two struggles, not only to get the medicines, but also to be able to prescribe. And I can tell you as personally, I go to a nurse practitioner, love her. I will not give her up for anybody. And she's never allowed to retire. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, one more question. Diane has one more question and, and we'll take that before we, we wrap up. What was the key thing that caused the big spread of nurse myth for free in the U.S.? So, and I guess what time frame are we talking about, too? 
Yes, we're talking about the 60s and 70s okay. where women were uh, claiming their rights, claiming their rights to all kinds of things, birth control, to self-determination, to what kind of birth they wanted. And uh, they were re resisting the, um, you know, the culture that said you have to go into the hospital and you have to go to a delivery room and you have to have your hands tied down and you have to have ether or, you know, and uh, so there was a large group of women who were burning their bras and <laughs> they wanted midwives. They wanted to have the birth that they wanted to have. So that was uh, a time when uh, midwifery really started to grow again in the US, but we've got a long way to go. Right now, about 10% of births are attended by midwives. You know, in Britain, it's more like 60%. And so we, you know, we still have a long way to go um, to uh, to really integrate uh, midwifery into the healthcare system in the United States. And I will let you know. My producer came up with a really good question. I said we wouldn't take one, but we'll take this last one. Urban areas. We talk so much about rural areas. And, and well, I heard about it, um, the midwives in urban areas. That is probably as popular as well. It is just as popular. As a matter of fact, in there are more nurse midwives in urban areas, just like there's more people in mm -hmm. urban areas. But um, you know, midwives cannot practice alone. It would not be ethical. By by alone, I mean without an obstetrician. Mm -hmm. And so there must be an obstetrician somewhere in the equation. So you know, some women will never need to see anybody but the midwife. They're fine. They're healthy. But you've got to have a place to take a woman or to refer to or to consult with if there are complications. And so in most large cities now today, there are large midwifery services here in Lexington, Kentucky, down the road from us here. We have uh, three nurse midwifery services now in each of the hospitals. So, you, you know, you are seeing it both in urban and in rural areas. And would this be something that I would speak to about? to my obstetrician and say, I want a midwife involved. And they, they, if I didn't know one, they could recommend the local midwife or organizations that are around me. Yes. And you can call the hospital where you intend to deliver, okay. or you can look online for midwifery services. Um, but, you know, the question is, if you're going to an, an obstetrician practice, do they employ midwives too? And so, if they don't, you might want to look for another one. That's a great point. If you want a midwife, yeah. yeah. That would be a great combination. That's a great point. It is, it is a great combination. And some hospitals just employ a group of midwives and they employ a group of obstetricians. And so they just work together. That's, that is becoming more and more common across the United States too. And let's hope uh, together we're so much stronger. Yeah, I hope we see that trend because I, like, you know, I mentioned, so sometimes those old ideas really are the best ideas for, for an individual at the time. I, I have to tell you that, Dr. Soon, you've educated me a couple different things on Mary and on midwives and nurse practitioners as well. And I thank you so much for joining us today, educating our viewers as well. And for those of you that might not know, uh, Dr. Stone and Frontier Nursing Service and Frontier Nursing University was a, a very high recommended viewer request. So I'm so happy that we were able to have you join us on Valentine's Day to talk about yes. babies. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And if anybody has any questions, they can write to me. My, my email is on our website. So and the website is uh, uh, pinned in the chat, and it's also down in the description if you want to continue watching the black and white video. That is also in the description, so you can contact uh, Dr. Stone by looking at the information in the description as well. So thank you so much, and bye, everybody. Bye.